We now call the meeting to order. We would now pay attention to Council Member Lesser for the invocation to be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I would like to invite uh, Barry Feeker, the Reverend Barry Feeker, um, to approach the podium and give us our invocation for this evening. Thank you. It's good to be with friends tonight. Uh, really good friends. Great leadership. Let's turn to God. Lord, we just thank you for you being our friend. We just thank you for loving us and guiding us and calling us for a great purpose in this life. I thank you for my friends here, my brothers and sisters, who have said yes to serving this great community in the heart of this great nation. Tonight, we just come to you and ask for that wisdom that we all need. We ask for understanding to talk about every issue, whether small or large, with the understanding that you would want us to have. We would ask that you'd bless this council and its leadership tonight, its mayor, city manager, and staff in the city of Topeka as they take on challenges that every city has but unique to ours. We ask that the heart that they stepped into this position with would continue to grow for the city and to grow for you and your heart for this city. We thank you, Lord, for uh, each family that's represented in this city tonight and the families of the members of this council, the mayor, the manager, and the staff. We ask that you would touch and bless and speak to those places where no one knows what may be going on except for these individuals here and help them to comfort them and give them purpose and encouragement with everything that they're doing. So tonight we ask for your blessing upon this meeting and blessing upon every decision that's made going forward. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have our friends from the cycling community to join us. We're going to celebrate today a proclamation that has three in one. It's celebrating Bike Month. Whereas the Topeka Metro Bikes established Topeka as the first city in Kansas to operate a bike share program, which resulted in 91,000 miles pedaled since the inception and has expanded to 300 bikes. And whereas Topeka continues to implement its bikeway master plan and having completed a total of 61.3 miles of non-street bikeways with funding commitments for full implementation of approximately 165 miles. Whereas Topeka is one of five cities in Kansas with the bronze level bicycle friendly community. Now, therefore, I, Michelle de la Isla, Mayor of the City of Topeka, Kansas, do by here proclaim May 2018th as Bike Month, May 14th to 18th as Bike to Work Week, and May 15th as your Ride with the Mayor Day. <laughs> So and as part of the celebration, I'll have some of the members here, uh, I think Carl say a few words or Sarah, but we have displayed here a quilt that represents, it was finished this early spring and is representative of all of the organizations that have participated and all the individuals who have made the, the city of Topeka such a bike friendly community. So Carl or Zach. Zach? Yeah, so I can say a few words about it. Um, this pretty amazing quilt is um, made by a uh, local um, bike activist or advocate, uh, Jane Lingenfelser Alford, um, and it really captures the the recent history of biking in Topeka. It's everything from the bikeways to the uh, Topeka Community Cycle Project um, to uh, and individuals that have been instrumental um, in making Topeka a great biking community, Topeka Metro Bikes in there, um, some Bike Across Kansas, uh, Caw Valley Bike Club, um, and many others, and just kind of the overall character of um, what cycling looks like in Topeka. It's going to be, we're going to um, try and get it on display throughout the community over the next um, several months, so um, we'll be able to get it out in the community and people see it as well.
So there's a little uh, flyer that we handed out that um, gives you a picture of it and then tells you a little bit about it on the back there as well. So thank you. Thank you, guys. We have another presentation today. If Liz could join us here in the front. <laughs> and if anybody wants to join over here. Whereas the city of Topeka. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I'll, I'll spit a little bit of the beans. The city of Topeka had a great strategic planning session, and one of our goals is to increase our population in the next few years by 1,000. And we said that we ap appreciate Liz's contributions <laughs> in that effort, <laughs> minus one. Um, but I just wanted to, we wanted to say thank you. Your council, your team appreciates everything that you do. We're excited um, that you're having a new life, and the council just wanted to go ahead and celebrate you. Ditto. <laughs> Mayor, did she get the lifetime supply from Henderson Construction of diapers? <laughs> And, and by the way, all, all the citizens of Topeka, this is not the treatment that we're going to give for population increase. That we're going to give. <laughs> <laughs> so at this moment, we will we have no presentation. We proceed with the roll call. Mayor De La Isla. Here. Council Members Hiller. Here. Clear. Here. Ortiz. Here. Emerson. Here. Padilla. Here. Jensen. Present. Mays. Here. Cohen. And Lusk. Here. We now proceed with appointments. If the clerk would read. A is a board appointment recommending the appointment of Cassandra Taylor to the Topeka Landmarks Commission for a term ending May, two, May 2nd, 2021. The mayor does not vote. We do have here Ms. Taylor. Um, what is the pleasure of the body? Deputy Mayor? Move to approve. We have a motion to approve. Councilman Lesser seconds. The mayor does not vote. Uh, we proceed with the voting. We have eight yes. Eight having voting yes, the motion passes. Ms. Taylor, if you would please stand and be recognized. Thank you so much for your service to our community. Before we proceed to the consent agenda, I would like to recognize Council Member Padilla. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to ask uh, if, uh, for consideration for a noise exemption requested for this weekend, uh, May 4th and 5th, from 8 p.m. until 12 midnight at the Sideways Bar and Grill, located at 555 Southwest 39th Street. Um, I'd like to ask this to be placed on the consent agenda, please. If there is consensus from the body, we will consider it added to the agenda and the clerk will read it. I see some consensus. <coughs> okay, so at this point, we now proceed with the consent agenda. If the clerk a would is a resolution introduced by Councilmember Jeff Cohen granting Specs Bar and Grill an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seat concerning noise provisions. B is a resolution introduced by Councilmember Sylvia Ortiz granting Augustine Munoz an exception to the provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seat concerning noise prohibitions. C, our minutes of the regular meeting of April 20, 2018. There is a list of applications before you for open after midnight and cereal malt, <coughs> cereal, cereal malt beverage limited licenses. Staff is recommending approval. And then the addition to the agenda is a resolution introduced by Councilmember Michael Padilla, 
granting sideways bar and grill an exception to the pr provisions of City of Topeka Code Section 945-150 at seat concerning those provisions. Body, do we have a motion? So moved. We have a motion by Councilwoman Ortiz. Second. We have a second by Councilman Emerson. Any discussion? We proceed with the voting. We have nine yes. Nine having voting yes, the motion passes. We now proceed with action items. A is a resolution introduced by City Manager Brent Trout approving the 2018 Neighborhood Event and Beautification Grant Program, Neighborhood Partnership Program, as recommended by the Neighborhood Partnership <coughs> Program Grant Review Committee. Mr. City Manager. Thank you, Mayor. At this time, I'd like to call Sasha Hahn, Neighborhood Relations Director Ford, to provide an overview of the uh, recommendations regarding the grant for a Neighborhood Partnership Program. Good evening, Governing, governing Body Members. Good evening. <laughs> Technical difficulties, as <laughs> usual. Um, you have included in your council packet a resolution as well as a summary of the 2018 first round recommendations for um, the neighborhood partnership project, uh, or I'm sorry, program projects. Um, this evening I just wanted to give you um, a brief update on the 2017 projects. So, um, and answering questions that you might have about the 18 projects. Whoops. You'll have to bear with me. So here, um, for the 2018 recommendations, first round, again, we will have a second round opening up almost immediately after your decision on these recommendations. We have Notoma submitting uh, two applications, one for Concert in the Park series in um, Garfield Park, uh, another for the Noto Movie Nights series, which they have partnered with the um, Historic North Topeka East Neighborhood Improvement Association to offer this year uh, their fall parade as well. And then finally, the Collins Park 4th of July <coughs> procession. You may recall that your 2017 projects were also, you had some Natoma projects, um, a Edgewood, Edgewood Park project, two College Hill projects, Potwin Place Circles project at First Impressions from Hunting, Huntington Condominiums. Just a few uh, snapshots of those projects for you guys um, to see what progress has been made. So here's some pictures of the concert series from Natoma from last summer. These are the bike racks that, that you all made possible for Greater Auburndale Neighborhood Association. College Hill is still in process on their entry monuments on 17th Street, but there's a rendering um, provided by <coughs> Mr. Sneven, who's here this evening. Um, we're excited about that. That's going to be great once they get it installed, and the installation should be <coughs> underway here soon. Potwin Place Circles. I don't know if any of you had the opportunity to go through <coughs> Potwin this Christmas season and see the improvements that they made to their displays, but you can see they had a lot of their neighbors involved in the project, and it, it turned out really nice for the holiday season. And then the Huntington Condominiums. This one was a little different, but definitely made a huge difference. If you've had the opportunity to go by um, this condominium development, you can really see the facelift that your grant provided. In addition to the work that the city grant um, paid for, they also did a ton of improvements to the buildings themselves that they covered. So that was a, a really unique but worthwhile project for the community. That is the end of my very brief presentation. I would be delighted to answer any questions that you have about the 2018 projects. Councilwoman Ortiz. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we let the public know that these are matching grants. Is that correct? 
Yes, ma'am. It requires a 50% match, either in in-kind or dollars, if, if they choose to provide that. And volunteer hours are also required as part of this grant. Okay, thank you, because I, I don't want people thinking we're just giving away money to, so I wanted them to understand this grant. I know it's new. Um, and then also, when do you take applications for this grant? So um, we started the applic uh, applications for this round, I believe, in February or March. I could, I did not bring the <coughs> exact dates, but the second round will open up um, tomorrow and we'll run the application cycle through June 1st. We'll accept applications through June 1st and then we'll pull our review committee members together the week of June 4th for review and hopefully be back to you all uh, by June 19th with a recommendation for the second round. So can you kind of explain that process so that they know that they have two rounds and do they qual qualify for each round or can you kind of explain that to the public? Sure. Um, so we offer the second round if we don't expend all of the funds in the first round. We haven't expended them all this time. Um, and we would prefer if we could spread it around to more neighborhoods, but in, using Notoma as an example, if we have multiple applications from one neighborhood and they're good projects that fit the grant program, they will be considered. Um, so they're not necessarily disqualified if they've applied in the first round or in the prior year. Um, it does, as you mentioned, require a 50% match, whether that's in kind or dollars itself, as well as volunteer hours. Um, the applications will be available on our website, or if they call our office, we're happy to print and mail them an application if that works. Thank you. Councilwoman Clear. How do we verify the volunteer hours? They actually have to provide that information on the back side of the project, so they log those hours for us. And um, we're using an honor system, but uh, I believe it's worked successfully so far. We do have photos of the volunteers actually on site doing the work. And one of my staff members actually goes out and kind of spot checks during that project cycle. Yeah, thank you. Seeing no further comments, this is an action item. There is nobody signed up for public comment on this item. Um, what is the pleasure of the body? Deputy Mayor? Move to approve. We have a second. motion for approval. Councilman Padilla seconds. If there's no other comments, we proceed with the voting. We have nine yes. Nine having voting yes, the motion passes. We now proceed to B, resolutions. B is a resolution introduced by council members Jeff Cohen and Aaron Mays concerning general public comment. Um, council member Cohen uh, let me know earlier that he's got a family event and he will be here a little bit late today. Um, if um, Council Member Mays would like to elaborate a little bit, just give us a brief overview again on what we had <coughs> agreed upon. Well, the discussion that we had had would be to uh, move the public comment to the beginning. Um, over the course of the conversation, we talked about perhaps uh, doing it at a time certain, somewhere in the middle of the meeting, perhaps, if we don't finish at an early hour. Um, and I believe we came up with uh, basically a trial run where we would um, do it, uh, the meetings of May 8th, 15th, and then June 5th as well, and then uh, kind of reassess where we're at. Um, does anyone else have anything they'd like to add to that? or Additional comments or questions? Deputy Mayor? Thank you. So just to make sure I'm reading this resolution properly, we're making a permanent change with the expectation that we'll change it back if we don't like it. Because this resolution says after June 5th, 2018, general public comment will occur after the announcement unless the governing body takes action to continue the practice. It is a trial period for the body to go ahead mm -hmm. and just see how it goes. That was what was agreed upon in the, sure. in the last meeting that we had. So it's not a permanent change. It's a trial basis. Okay. For us to reevaluate then if we want to continue the practice. <clears throat> okay. 
Well, because this resolution mm -hmm. is a permanent change. No. 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 Don't you just read? After. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of it's at, it's staying there. All right. Reading the wrong word. <laughs> it's been one of those days. Okay. Um, I understand. With that clarification, I will move to approve. We have a motion for approval. We have a second. Any additional comment? We pre oh, yeah. Councilwoman Ortiz. Um, thank you. I won't support this because I don't want to confuse the public. And I think if it does pass, I think it's going to be very important that the clerk's office tells them that this is a trial run because we're gonna have people waiting in front, waiting in the back, but um, if we're gonna do it, I'd like to see us do it. And if we're not, um, we're not. But I, I just think it's it would be too confusing. So those are my comments. Before we go to additional comments, we do have somebody from the public signed up to speak. Uh, Ms. Teresa Miller, if you could come forward. Good evening and happy May Day. This is my favorite time of year. Um, well, I'm, I've been on a lot of board over the years, 15 years, and I've never had public comment in any of, on any of these boards at the beginning. My, my concern is, and sometimes you sign up for public comment, but then there's something that night that you guys talk about, and then you're jotting down notes, and then there's something you want to bring up, even though maybe you passed or that. But there's something that someone might want to say uh, on the comments on what you have done. So I'm kind of like on the fence. I, it's kind of putting the horse before the cart. Um, I'm kind of confused on <coughs> why you would want public comment at the very beginning. So that is my comment because I've never seen it done in any of the meetings or boards I've ever been to. So um, I mean, I'm try anything, but to me, I think it defeats the purpose because, like I say, sometimes things come up during your meetings that somebody will want to comment on later if that has signed up that wants to comment at the end of the night. Right. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Next question. Oh, yes, Deputy Mayor. Uh, so um, along the lines of what you're discussing, this doesn't replace people's ability to sign up to speak at specific items, correct? No. It's just the general public comment. So to some degree, you could indeed continue to to listen right. to a given discussion and then make public comment after that. Right. Because uh, I do agree with you. Right. You're absolutely right. If, if you want to talk about a particular thing and then you're asked to do that before right. we even discuss it. But if you're already here and you didn't sign up for that and then you got a light bulb goes on, ah, you know, I wish I would have said this. I want to be have it public record. You'll be able to do it at the end of the night with public comment, which you wouldn't be able to do it at the beginning if you do your public comments at the beginning. And that's true, but you would still have had to sign up anyway. To do public comment, yes. Right. But what I'm saying is, if you have, there's something you did not sign up for to talk on personally, but then you have an idea or something, a comment at the end after what's been done, then you have an opportunity to say something about that. And that's true, but if you don't sign up for public comment either at the beginning, middle, or the end, then you still right. wouldn't be able to. But make you have to sign up. I understand you right. have to sign up. So I get that. I understand. All right. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Councilwoman Hiller. I, I have a question, if you don't mind, for Ms. Miller as well. Because my sense is that one of the reasons that the gentleman who sponsored this did it was that they kind of felt bad for people who had to sit hours and hours and hours through a meeting mm -hmm. to get a chance to speak. And um, if we could ask Ms. Miller, she's done that before and also has visited with other people who have been through that. What, what I think I'm hearing her say is that she doesn't mind that, um, but I wondered what her take is on what other people have felt about that. Ms. Miller, would you be so kind to approach the bench? I'm sorry. <laughs> Call back. What is that again, Karen? I'm, re I'm really sorry. I spaced you out. <laughs> well, we you know, usually call you back. You get, you got your, uh, the question was, you've, you've been through a lot of meetings, a lot. and you've known a lot of other people who've needed to wait all the way until the end for public comment. Yes. My assumption with when the gentleman proposed this was that they were trying to spare people like you from having to sit all the way right. through the meeting. You've, you've talked about your own feelings. Has your sense been that other people feel the same way or that they don't mind? Um, they don't mind winning because here's what, how I'm thinking a lot of other people think. 
if what you come up here for is worth waiting for, and if you have that strong of feeling to, to bother to come up here and talk <coughs> about it in the first place, you're willing to wait. If you have to wait till midnight, it's worth waiting for to have your comment put out there because it makes it a record. It's on record once you say it. And so to me, it's really important. I don't care how late I have to wait, but to me, it's important to at least have somebody hear me. So I, I just don't understand why we need to put it at the beginning. Because like I said, there's been times I've signed up for public comment, but something else had gone on that evening I did not sign up for that I wanted to comment about. And so that gave me an opportunity to do that. But if you put it at the beginning, I'm not going to have that opportunity to, to put my two cents worth in. Thank you. OK. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Emerson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I guess I had a general question about um, how will we notify people of this? I mean, although I'd, I'd love if Mr. Venture had like a headline tomorrow saying, you know, city to move public comment on the front page. But this is since this is just going to take place next week, um, how are we going to let people know, I guess, that soon? And I, and I understand that it may seem like it's immediate, but the agenda has been out with the document for two weeks now. Um, we've had the discussion in the meeting where we set the dates that we were going to try it for. Of course, we're having the discussion right now to let people know that next week it'll happen. And I'm sure that should the vote pass, I am certain that our friends both uh, in Capital Journal and KSNT and WIBW are more, more than happy to go ahead and make sure that there is a plug plug in for, for it. I expect the headline tomorrow. <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. So just a quick question. We allow people to sign up to speak on any given item in the agenda. Um, is there any reason why we couldn't allow them to choose whether or not to sign up at the beginning or the ending to speak for public comment? I mean, I realize we'd have to amend this to allow them to do so. But that would seem to solve part of the issue that was brought up. If you want to listen to the entire meeting and then offer some remarks about that meeting, if you had the option to sign up for general public comment at the beginning or the ending, in addition to the items on the agenda, would that not give everybody the best of all world? Council Ortiz. I can appreciate what you're saying, and I can appreciate what's trying to be done, but this is where we come to our meetings to get our work done. Mm -hmm. And we have to get our work done. And that's why some people, you know, I've talked to some commissioners, and they said that's why we don't have public comment like we do, because this is the opportunity that we got to come together mm -hmm. and get our work done. I'm all for public comment. I really am. Um, but there's times that it could be 30, 40 minutes long, mm -hmm. you know. And I, I just like to come in and get it <laughs> running. And, 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 but at the end of the day, I, I look at this is our agenda. So we can come in, get our work done. I just don't want to confuse the people. Mm -hmm. And when we start giving them so many choices, there's too many choices out there. So we got to stop public comment, stop, go back to work, stop public comment. I, it just doesn't, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just can't get with it. Councilwoman Clear. I don't know which way I lean, but I think that it, it, this is an opportunity to try it. I mean, we're not going to know unless we try it, if mm -hmm. it's going to work or not work. And we can always say no or yay or, but I think we ought to try it. Councilman Mays. I, I agree with, thank you, Mayor, sorry. Um, I agree with uh, Councilwoman Clear. This is an opportunity for us to try it. I do think that an idea of, uh, of possibly doing it both at the beginning and the end, we're going to have the same amount of people, right? If somebody wants to speak, whether they're at their beginning or the end, they're all going to get four minutes. Um, so, I mean, whether we, if we have an hour's worth of comments at the beginning or an hour at the end or a half hour split between the two, I think this is a good opportunity for us to do, in my opinion, what's best for the people that are coming to speak with us. And, and ultimately, they're the ones that elect us. They're the ones that, you know, put us here. And so we need to, to be available to them. And in my opinion, uh, I, I think doing it at the beginning and the end is, is, is a good idea because then if somebody wants to sit through the meeting, they can. If somebody wants to, they just have a little item that they're having a problem with and they need to address the council and they can come and get it over with and leave if they want. Um, I, I mean, I would, I would welcome that amendment um, if somebody wanted to, uh, to do that. Okay. Deputy Mayor. 
Do we have a we motion, have a on, motion the on the floor? Right now. Yeah, we have. Yeah. Okay. So I would move to amend to allow people to sign up for the beginning or the ending. We we to would have to motion. Yeah. Yeah. We couldn't amend. We it. can't amend the motion that's on the floor. With the consent of the person. So did you make the amendment, the yes. motion? Okay. I, I took your comment as the okay. consent. Okay. Yeah. You're the person who made the motion. Yes. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Okay. So You're good. We have an amendment proposal yes. that you could have public comment. So they could choose to speak at the beginning or the ending or for the general end. public comment, but then they could still speak on each of the points they wanted to. Okay. Do we have a second? Councilwoman Clear seconds. Councilman Emerson. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Just a clarification, just for this trial period, is that correct? Absolutely. Thank you. So do we need language? Yeah. Councilman Lesser. So are, under this amendment, are we going to have a public comment at the beginning and at the end, two public comments? Correct. So an individual cannot sign up for both of them. They would choose whether they will go to the more uh, the first pub public comment or the end public the comment. Thank you. We can add and after announcements as well to this, but I wanted to clarify one thing because based on what Councilmember May said, what I heard was that if somebody called and said I would like to make public comment, that they have to choose if they want before or after. Correct? They can't sign up mm -hmm. for both before and after, so they mm -hmm. don't get. Okay. Right. Just so Brenda knows this when they call in and say which would you like to select before or after so for clarification this is a vote on an amendment to the current resolution not the vote for the resolution and the current amendment that we would be voting on would state that an individual can call ahead and sign up for public comment <laughs> either for beginning of the meeting or at the end of the meeting um, mayor um, in section one of the resolution um, right now it states all general public comment will occur after roll call at the governing body meeting scheduled for May 8th 15th and June 5th so it should just read probably all general public comment will occur after roll call and after announcements mm -hmm. at the governing body meeting scheduled for those dates so we just add those three words in the city attorney this is a home rule issue correct Um, I believe the mayor voted on council rules before. Yeah. Okay, just making sure. So it's sure. not a unique. <coughs> yeah. Okay, we have a motion. Okay. Do we have additional comment? <laughs> Seeing no additional comment, we proceed with the voting. Okay, we have seven yes, Ms. Ortiz and Mr. Lesser voting no. Seven having voting yes, the amendment passes. So now we have a resolution in front of us. Would the amendments proposed? Is there additional comment with regards to the motion? This motion would make the adoption of these amendments in the resolution that was presented originally. If there's no comments, we proceed with the voting. I, I believe you already took care of that with this last amendment. Oh, because it took care of it all? Oh, yeah. so, awesome. Yeah, so you're good. <laughs> Wonderful. So the motion carries so that everybody knows out there what we just voted on is that if you're interested in signing up for public comment, when you call the clerk's office, you let them know if you would like to sign up for public comment after the roll call or after the whole meeting has been completed. We now move to item C. C is a resolution introduced by City Manager Brent Trout authorizing and adopting the 2019 to 2028 Capital Improvement Plan and the 2019 to 2021 Capital Improvement Budget and approving the project budget. City Manager. Mayor, Governing Body. Tonight I want to cover a few uh, items. Uh, there have been a number of questions and concerns that have been raised following the April 17th deferment of the CIP resolution. The first item that I want to cover relates to the overall debt levels. The city is in a good position with overall debt. The credit ratings are AA for GO debt, according to Standard & Poor's, and our revenue debt is AA3, according to Moody's. As both are high rated, or rated at a high grade and result in competitive pricing for our bonds. 
Staff prepared the proposed CIP using the guidance of the governing body's debt policy and CIP policy. The city receives consistently high management and financial policy ratings for our ra from our rating agencies. Additionally, the number of bids we receive on our bond sales have increased dramatically over the past <coughs> few years. These tangible measures speak to how the city and our financial partners' practices are viewed by independent and professional outside agencies. To the specific part of appropriate bonding amounts and geo bond debt payment management, the governing body has instituted one of the best policies available to a community when it instituted the $9 million per year geo bond cap. This policy has led to a bending curve for, down, for debt payments on the downward level. Projections show the city spending less in the area of debt payment over the next five years and beyond if this policy remains in place. The level of debt service has remained consistent over the last few years and has created available cash to fund projects under $125,000. In the area of utilities debt management, we have projections to sell bonds in increasing amounts over the next five years. One of the primary purposes of this additional bonding is to do work on our infrastructure that has been delayed for many years. I understand the concerns of too much debt being added and will be addressing this issue with a study related to the ratio of debt service payment to operating budget as a part of revenues we receive each year. I need to study this ratio and determine what the appropriate percentages for each of these parts are in order to ensure healthy utilities. We must invest in our infrastructure, but we need to make sure that it is at a sustainable level. In the area of use of reserves, the city is in a good position with regards to reserve levels and is in compliance with the governing body's <coughs> reserve policy. In fact, they are above the required policy to the point of providing a favorable position for us in the future. Any unbudgeted use of reserves would need to be approved by the governing body for the rules. The use of unbudgeted reserves has allowed for the completion of several great projects, according to staff, over the last few years, such as the 6th Street water line and the Wanamaker water line. There's been a lot of discussion regarding cash versus debt. The city's CIP debt policy provides minimum thresholds for bonding of a project. The policy states the city shall use debt financing primarily to finance capital projects with a relatively long life, typically no less than 10 years, and costing no less than $125,000. Over the last three years, the CIP has incrementally increased the cash projects to an average level of about $2 million. In a tight budget environment, it is always a challenge to free up cash for projects. Staff will continue to make a commitment to continue to provide cash for projects where appropriate. It's generally appropriate for all current and future users to pay for projects over the lifespan of a project, which is why bonding is considered an appropriate method of financing for long lifespan projects. I want to talk about a couple of project-specific questions. There have been a series of project-specific questions. These questions have been addressed individually and can be addressed as needed tonight. There are two projects the staff would support amending and if the governing body so moves. The Oakland Backup Generator Project, number 291090, which for a full description is on page 83 of the book, can be amended from $5,495,97,000 to $1.5 million. The change will be sufficient to create the backup generator capacity at this plant as a revised project. The other project is the Fire Hydrant Improvements Project at the Topeka Zoo, which is project number 301059. A full description is on page 110. The project has been sufficiently completed with a change order to the current water hydrant project. The project in this budget is not needed and therefore can be removed from the budget. I would ask that a council member move to request these amendments to the budget to ensure that a majority of the members are supportive of these changes. In addition, it was mentioned that there are some concerns regarding the ADA assessment project. The city has conducted assessments in the past and believes that we are in compliance with all ADA requirements. But the project is listed as a recommendation by staff to have an expert complete a, a review of all buildings. The project is to be completed with cash in 2021. Therefore, the inclusion in the CIB does not ensure that the project will occur since it is a cost cash project the funding will not be available until that budget year. Staff will conduct additional evaluation of the need for this project and the project amount prior to next year's budget and discuss the project again with the council during the next CIB budget review. 
process changes. Staff agrees the workshops to review the CIP would be helpful and will address this in the next CIP. I have some ideas regarding this and I believe these modifications in next year's process will allow an opportunity for the governing body to discuss the proposed CIB CIP as a group. I want to most of all thank my staff for the many hours of work they have put in the process. I am requesting consideration of approval by the governing body of the CIB CIP budget with any approved amendments tonight. Staff and I stand ready to answer your questions at this time. Thank you, City Manager. Before we proceed into any body discussion, we have two individuals signed up for public comment. Um, the first person signed up to speak is with Teresa Miller. Good evening again. I sent you all a letter. I have been running my NIA for almost 15 years because nobody else wants to do it. And in that time, I have tried to draw attention to Northwest Tyler Street. That is one of the most known streets in Topeka. There is no place to really walk on the side without trying to get hit. It has a double yellow line on it. When you try to ride bikes, you can't go around them. Or if you try to go around them, you're going to hit somebody head on. Um, my main concern is I can count the sidewalks on my side in North Topeka. You can go down Topeka Boulevard has a sidewalk, Lyman Road to the four-way stop has a sidewalk, and then Gordon has a sidewalk to, uh, to the country area part, to almost to Vail. We have no sidewalks to walk on or to ride bikes on. And we have been pushing health things in this city for a long time. I'm one of them. I have to drop a lot of weight to get my knees operated on. One way I know I can do it is ride a bike. But I'm sorry, I'm not going to be the big target over in North Topeka for everybody to go after because <laughs> I'm just too big of a person and I'm not sturdy on a bike. So I'm afraid I'm going to get hit. So I would really ask you, I, this project was put out there clear back to 2014, I think it was. They put the project out there on Lyman Road, on, on Tyler. It was originally going to go to, to <clears throat> Morris, but then they cut it back to, to Paramore from uh, Lyman Road on Tyler. And then I was told by Jason Peake last year they broke it into two parts, two different projects. And it was supposed to, it was actually supposed to start this spring. And then I was told it was two, 2020. Now if I notice it's actually 2023, what happens when you keep moving those projects? They phase out. I can't afford to have this phase out. We need to have some place for these people to walk and ride their bikes. That's why I got on the, master, uh, the pedestrian master plan. They promised me, see, promised me safety for my people, safety for the school kids over there. These, they can't ride their bikes over there without putting their life in their hands. So I wish you would really look at these projects, put them back in sooner than what, 2023, because we need to make our kids healthy. And one way is to ride bikes and we need to walk. And a lot of parents don't let their kids go too far. So I, if we would get the sidewalks down tighter, that would give them a way to walk to the stores, because we have a lot of people that walk. And it would also give some of us a chance to ride bikes without getting ran over. I really would appreciate it. And if the quote, I don't know if you read the quote at the very, at the very ending. Public Works said, the quality of life for these who live work and play in Topeka, they depend on the quality of the city inf in infrastructure. infrastructure. Please live up to your, prom to your word and your promise that you gave the North Topeka NIA. I really appreciate it. I hope you look at this and put it sooner than later because 2023 is just too long. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Miller. The next person signed up to speak is Mr. Joseph Ledbetter. Governing body, uh, I'm here to speak on the CIP uh, projects. And I am going to speak about the utilities in the next item and those bonds. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do is uh, <clears throat> remind you a few weeks ago, and I appreciate the way you've slowed this down, because I think we needed to have a really healthy discussion about CIP. I mean, this is the direction of the city over the next five years. And uh, 
So what I'm what I'm handing out is is really germane to this topic because it's about economic development. And I just there's one for the record, one for the manager, and one for the voting members. Uh, I know you've seen this before, but what this shows is that from 2004 and through current, we have dropped uh, our GDP for this county, this city, six uh, percent. So one of the things that uh, CIP budgets can do is they can bring in infrastructure that will actually uh, enhance your economic development. Now we saw a little bit of that done in Highcrest, and I won't go into detail on that, but there were a couple roads and projects over there that greatly enhanced those neighborhoods, and you saw one of the neighborhoods uh, become healthier uh, because the roads were completely repaired in that neighborhood, and they went from at risk to uh, basically outpatient level in Eastern Highcrest. Uh, there was also code enforcement, so that, that also goes along with infrastructure. But what I want to say is tonight we have an opportunity to put the 29th Street, the KTA uh, interchange uh, project on California uh, and move it from 2022 to 2019, which is supported by the East Topeka Council, which I'm a chair of, or co chair of, uh, with momentum 2000. I'm sorry, 2022, got a lot of words here. Uh, also on, on place, which is part of that momentum 2022, there's been a lot of discussion about infrastructure, which actually includes parks and recs, so we got that included. Uh, but what we're looking at is on the east side, we've had a lack of spending, and that's not to take away from any other part of the city, but there is a concern uh, at that uh, greater Topeka partnership level that these east side in some areas has been left out so in order to improve that area dramatically if we had that entry exit uh, if we get the design work done i think it gives us leverage to uh to work with kdot which now owns the uh turnpike system and uh to come up with ways to get that project funded and basically what you've got is a desert of ability and connectability to that highway system. It's six miles. You cannot get on it. You cannot get off of it. Uh, such an entry would absolutely help serve the lake and the ball diamonds and the, the uh, various activities that go on over there, serve that large community around the lake so they could go east and west. Uh, because actually on the east side, if you go far <laughs> enough east in this county, a lot of people go to Lawrence because it's just easier to connect to highways uh, than it is to Topeka itself and to the west side where a lot of shopping is done. So I would encourage you to uh, move this funding up. Uh, I would encourage you to uh, uh, also fix the traffic lights. Uh, I've been talking about that for years. I'd like to, and, I, and I'm not the only one. There's a lot of people who'd like to see these traffic lights synchronized. I sent you all an email earlier. Uh, I was told that we can fix these lights with software for about three to 4,000 apiece. We've got about 2,000 or 200 of them in the city, according to the numbers I got from the city staff. I don't know why we couldn't make a big dent in synchronizing these lights in 2019 and make it easier to go across the city. Uh, that's enough. Thanks. Appreciate Thank you, Mr. Ledbetter. <coughs> All right, we have heard from our community with regards to public comment at this point. I would open it up for discussion with regards to the body. Councilman Emerson. Madam Mayor, uh, as I understand it, we're actually considering action on this tonight. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. So before we can discuss, do we need a motion to approve? We could do discussion prior, or we could have a okay. motion for discussion. Okay. For approval, and then we could have discussion after the motion. Um, well, I guess my question is, the, the particular projects that uh, Mr. Trout talked about, I would like to make a motion to amend those two projects. So is, uh, will the order of that, we first have to move to yes, approve? Yes, make a motion for approval. So Deputy Mayor is making a motion for approval. Do we have a second? Second. Second by Councilman Padilla. Now we're open up for discussion. Councilman Emerson has an Th amendment, yes. a motion for amendment. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I actually have um, four specific that, well, really three, um, that, I, that I'd like to talk about. The first two are those reductions, and the first is page 83, the Oakland backup generators. And um, 
it, it started because uh, we'd asked some questions, I'd asked some questions, and uh, I'd really like to hand it to <clears throat> Mr. Copley and uh, Bob Sample over there. They got together and, and came up with an alternate way to, to get basically all the functionality they needed at a much less cost. So I really appreciate all the work they did uh, and their staff. So I would move that we reduce that project budget by roughly four million, it's 5.497 million, and now make it 1.5 million. Say it again, please. Sure. So reduce the budget by to 1.5 million. It's page 83. And can we do these together, or does each one need a separate? Well, could we go one by one? Sure. So that way we keep it cleaner? And sure. uh, so the first motion that we have in front of us when, if you recall, city manager discussed a few motions that staff, amendments that staff had looked at and considered. The first one of those um, being the generator. This is the first motion that would reduce the amount of the budget from the 5 million to the 1.5. So that everybody is on the same page. So do we have a second? Deputy Mayor seconds. Do we have any conversation? Seeing no, we will proceed with a motion. Mm -hmm. With the vote. Sorry. We have nine yes. Nine having voting yes. The first amendment passes. You said you had a yes, motion. Yes, ma'am, uh, if I may have two more. Uh, on page 110, we have the Topeka Zoo fire hydrants. And it, it's another good news story. In this case, I was actually asking uh, uh, city manager and, and Mr. Gerber about this project. Uh, there's an ongoing project at the zoo. Uh, they're already putting in some fire hydrants. And it was my suggestion that um, they go ahead and have that contractor while they're on site instead of remobilizing. They could do that for, I think, a pretty reasonable price. Well, as it turns out, uh, Mr. Wiley was way ahead of me, and he actually got that done. I, I believe the total cost, we had it in here for 500000 and him and his staff, and uh, Mark Schreiner got that done for, I think, less than $50,000. So it's a fantastic, uh, um, and the contractor did, I was, we were out there for uh, the uh, Roar, mm -hmm. Roar and Pour this weekend, and that contractor did a, did a great job. So I would move that we eliminate that project. It's page 110. And I have conferred with both uh, staff and, and Mr. Wiley, and in fact, it is done. So we have a motion, and we have a second by the deputy mayor. Any comments or questions? Seeing none, we proceed with the voting. This voting is to eliminate the $500,000 allocated to the fire hydrants. We have nine yes. Nine having voting yes, the amendment passes. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. If I, if I may, one, one last amendment. Um, and keep in mind, these last two things, I've, I've been all about saving money. Um, However, as, as Mr. Ledbetter so eloquently spoke about, um, over in my side of town, we are con con severely constrained by the turnpike that goes through our neighborhoods. Uh, not only can we not access the turnpike, but indeed it, it cuts off almost every through street in District 4. Um, secondly, there's currently a county project to widen 29th Street uh, to five lanes from the KTA all the way out to Croco Road. Um, while the projects, it, I think it would be a travesty if that project gets done and some changes that we would need implemented for this project are not in place. Uh, third, we had a economic study that we got in 2016. Uh, and I am, frankly, I'm sometimes suspicious of economic uh, studies because they tend to be very rosy. But this one is showing over 30 years a basically a $1.2 billion um, economic impact generated by that construction. Now, if, if you think that's outlandish, even if you cut that in half, it's still $600 million over the next 30 years. And I'll tell you, I think this project would be uh, instrumental in transforming uh, the east side of town. And um, lastly, in talking with Parks and Rec at the lake, um, they are doing a lot of things out there to, uh, to drive demand. One of the problems is, though, when people come, they're getting off the turnpike, and, and it's, it's a pretty convoluted way you get there. Um, 
and, and speaking with the staff out there, they're confident we would get a lot more overnight stays if, if we had a, a quicker way to access. Um, and lastly, as actually talking to uh, Councilman Lesser last week, he actually pointed out something that I had not thought about. Um, most of our restaurants are out on the west side, as you guys know. And right now, um, just because of how long it'll take me to drive over to the west side of Wanamaker, I do. Uh, I think a lot of people do go to um, Lawrence instead of Topeka. So I am not in any way asking that the city fund the construction of the project at this time. However, it's $500,000 in our budget um, that I think would be money well spent. And right now, again, we can leverage that there's already consultants on board doing the work out there on 29th with the county. So I would move that we simply move up. It's already in there. It's on page 45. I would ask that we simply move up the KTA interchange to tw the 500,000 to 2019. And, and I would ask um, if, if savings can't be found in the budget, then I would just suggest that, you know, right now we have a, um, we have a, a, a huge reserve. Um, and I would, I would simply ask that that be paid out of that if we could not find savings in the budget otherwise. So that would be my motion, long-winded way of saying, can we, I'd like to move the KTA design from 2023, I believe it's in there right now, to mm -hmm. 2019, the 500,000. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second by Councilwoman Ortiz, City Manager. Mayor Governing Body, I understand uh, Councilwoman Emerson's, uh, <laughs> huh, she almost got <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Emerson's request. I, mean, the, the, I understand the motivation for it, and there are many reasons to do so. Um, for me, from the information that I've received from staff, uh, Deputy Manager Gerber or Planning Director Finder can talk better as to what was talked about in the past for that. I currently, through the help of Councilmember Mays, I have a meeting with the KTA Director coming up May 10th. And um, this is obviously a topic of discussion at that meeting. Um, the thing that I would say is that if I come up out of that meeting and determine that there is no need, um, I would like to report back that we not spend the money on that if it's not required. I mean, if your desire is to approve it, and the majority I understand that, and, and that really the, the funding sources you mentioned at this point are probably our only option, given where we're at with a number of items late in the day in the budget. Um, but I would ask that we not spend it in haste if it really will not generate the opportunity. And the people at KTA are going to be able to inform me of that. And so I, I understand the desire to do it as a placeholder, but I would also like to come back and state that we not spend that money if it really isn't going to be fruitful for any reason. Sure, if you may, Madam Mayor. Yes. Um, thank you for that, Mr. Sir. Trout. And, and I knew you guys were going to be meeting with them. And I, I guess my comment is this is for 2019, and we will know by that time uh, you will have had this meeting. But if we don't put it in now, we can't. Understood. So thank you. Councilman Padilla. And Councilwoman Clear. Well, um, we've had a lot of discussion about this, and I've heard from a lot of citizens, and um, we've talked about it. Uh, and I would be in support of Council Emerson's uh, wow. amendment because I think we have to have some good faith effort. We we have to be able to walk in there, and county and the city manager is in a position to say that the council given that opportunity, would be supportive of, of this effort. And so I would speak in behalf of his amendment. Councilwoman Clear, then Councilman, then Deputy Mayor, then Councilwoman Mertes. Okay, I have a different way to spend the money. <laughs> and I agree, I like the idea of the intercha interchange, but um, I remember last time we discussed it, we all kind of got on the same page and not such a good idea. So I would like to go back and revisit why we had said, no, nah, not a good idea before. I agree with the city manager. I think that's a little too fast, um, especially when there are projects that keep getting pushed back. So if we can spend the money, um, I'd like to see that Tyler Street done. I mean, it, that has been on the books for a long time, and she is so correct. There are no sidewalks over there at all. Um, and I would also like to see, even though I'm not sure I'm totally on board with the cost, but the ADA assessment, 
I don't think we can afford to put that back to 2021, and that's only 125,000. I think we could do that for less, but I would like to see that moved up to like 2019. So those are my two amendments with that money. So we, we currently have one amendment. Once we're done with voting this one up or down, we will absolutely go and re revisit your amendments. Okay. Um, Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, so I absolutely support needing an interchange on uh, 29th Street or in that area. Um, my concern with this is we design things in Topeka, put them on the shelf, pull them out again, design them again, put them on the shelf, pull them out again, design them again, then design them again, and then we build them. So my fear in designing this so early before we have any kind of commitment from the state is that it will get designed, we'll go show it to the state, they'll say that's great, we'll put it on the shelf, and then things will improve, technology will get better, and then in a couple years when they're actually ready to build a project, we'll have to design the thing all over again, and then possibly they'll build it. So my fear is that, you know, yes, we, we absolutely need something to go and work with the state on, but I don't know that we need an entire $500,000 shovel-ready project because, let's face it, none of the shovel-ready projects we ever have ever get built the way they were initially designed. They just don't. So um, one compromise could be, let's earmark the funds, and then given the outcome of that meeting, have something to fall back to. So if it's absolutely not possible to, to get that done within a reasonable amount of time, maybe we determine how much we need to actually do a rough sketch rather than a full, complete design. So what's a, what would it cost to a rough sketch? And then what would we spend the remainder of the money on this year, and I think Councilwoman Claire makes some excellent suggestions. I don't know how many inches of sidewalk $500,000 does, but I'm gathering probably not much. However, um, what if we did that? So we would earmark it, given the outcome of the meeting, if it's not successful, or we're able to come up with a smaller plan, at least to, sh to prove viability, then we would earmark the money for other things. I just I don't know that spending five hundred thousand dollars for a shovel ready project that's gonna to have to get designed again is the best the best use of our money. I absolutely support it, absolutely think we need to take something to the state, but is it a shovel ready project? I don't think so. Councilwoman Ortiz. Thank you. I know you know our um we had a mayor that said we have a part of town that's up and a part of town that's down. And East Topeka is down. Um, and I think we all know that. We've talked about economic development. And I think this would be a huge, a huge, I want to thank Mr. Henderson for, for bringing that out. Um, it would be a huge um, asset to East Topeka. We don't have enough volume going through there. He's correct. People do, they shop at Walmart. On the, on the outskirts of, because where they live is 20 minutes to, to Lawrence. So they'd rather just go that way than to go west. Everybody doesn't like to go out west. It's too congested. So I, I will support this. I know that we have some plans already in place, some very good plans. Um, so I, I want to keep the discussion rolling. I, I would love to earmark the money. I think that's great. Um, and I, I agree with the ADA, um, Sandra. <coughs> Sidewalks, I don't have sidewalks. There's uh, all kind of parts of towns that don't have sidewalks, and there's all kind of parts of towns that have dirt streets, and I know North Topeka has some. I have some in my area as well. So I think we really need to look at that half cent sales money to make sure that it covers, everybody pays into it, that everybody can get out of something out of it. And that's what's important to me when I think about um, no streets and no sidewalks. But I thank you again. Um, for finding that, and, and I would support this wholeheartedly. Councilwoman Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. I'm trying to listen to all the different points. We've all talked about it before in meetings and outside of meetings. I'm also recalling at our retreat on Saturday, one of the things that we put out on the table at first that worked very much to, uh, very successfully, was the fact that not everything that's really of value costs money. And so I was trying to listen to what city manager was saying. Um, 
Well, for one thing, I know that Mr. Emerson already has a concept that's pretty much a back of the napkin <coughs> concept of how to do that design less expensively and more effectively that does not match what we spent a lot of money on the first time. And I, in listening to <coughs> City Manager Trout, I don't want to misstate, but were you saying that you've got that meeting and then we could kind of see where it went from there and if it looked like it was of great value to spend whatever amount of money to advance those plans, maybe even this year, we'd figure it out at that point, relying on your feedback from dealing with KDOT? Because what I'm seeing is if we move the 500000 then it, it throws other projects. But if there is a formal or even informal commitment on the council and with the city manager that if it looks like it would, would be a go, we'll, we'll figure it out, then we might not need to, to move the money. City manager, is that, yes. am I, is that what you meant? Yes. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilman Emerson. Thank you. Um, and, and thank you. I, I do appreciate the comments uh, uh, that were made, both, both in support and against. Um, I guess I guess my question is I, I don't know what the definition uh, you know to your point uh, deputy mayor I don't know what the definition of, of a success I mean if they go down there and they he's probably not going to go down there and they're going to say yes you know overnight um, so that'll be hard to quantify but I do know as as, uh, as Mr. Padilla said we have to show that we're willing to put some skin in the game uh, and and I as as uh, Councilwoman Hiller alluded. Yes, I, I think actually it won't cost anyone near, near five hundred thousand to actually do this design. Uh, however, that's that's what the project's in there for right now. Um, so I, I would be. Um, I, I guess I don't know if we don't move this up, how we can spend the money otherwise. In, in case you do get good news, I City actually have an idea. Um, as we look at what we're talking about, number one, we're looking at the only real revenue we have is any savings we may have in this budget year uh, or potentially using reserves. Um, if we were to look at having this discussion when we get into the operating budget and talk about first us finding out a cost for services, um, looking at adding it to the operating budget, which we could do and put it in contract services for one or the other um, through the Public Works Department. We could actually have a more informed discussion because the, the money that we're talking about utilizing is not going to come from anything related to geo bonds, motor right. fuel. It, it's going to come from a different area. So I think we could have this discussion in about two months or a month and a half when we start digging into the operating budget and either make a decision to use money from the current budget year or reserves going into 2019 so that we could actually provide you as staff better explanation as to what the cost will be and what input we receive from KTA reference future of this. And, and it would be my pledge that we would actually have that as a specific question of, of discussion at operating budget time. Because the, the money that's, the, the point I'm trying to make is the money we're talking about, because there is no additional money, would have to come from one of those sources, either savings from this year or reserves, which we can end up doing in operating budget as well. And if I may, Madam Mayor. Yes, Councilman can, Emerson. Thank you. And that can be done without moving it up in the capital improvement plan? Correct. Yes, that would be accurate. We would simply, that would be an additional discussion where since it would be outside of the current budget, it would have to come before the governing body anyway. Right. Councilman Ortiz. Ortiz. Well, you said you'd have to do that anyway. Why? Because that money's not set aside is what you're saying? Correct. As part of the reserve policy and the utilization of reserve funds to do a project, it has to come back before the governing body for consideration. Okay. So would we all need to agree on it now? But, I mean... No, ma'am, you would not need to vote on it now. It would be an item that we would have as a specific agenda just discussion. Pull it, you're saying just pull it out? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It would simply stay where it's at as we approve the CIP, but then we would have a specific discussion as an agenda item relative to the information that I find out regarding that because it's look, you know, it would be utilizing reserves, which would be normal procedure for consideration. 
But be mindful if we start doing that. <laughs> Understood. Yes. But I, I would really feel better about providing you better information regarding what type of uh, level of uh, cost we would be looking at in order to provide us something that is a uh, complex enough uh, to provide an understanding for um, how it works with what's being done by the county and at the appropriate level so that we don't go too far, as Councilman Jensen's mentioning, in, in actual design of something, but get it far enough along to make sure that it's going to work with what's being done by the county. Councilwoman Ortiz. City Manager, how much time do you need? Do you, do you well, know? I think within the time frame of what we'll be looking at for the operating budget, we can probably pull that together in a month, a month and a half. You know, the basic information, the meeting with KTA is already set. And so we would present the information to them on our request uh, for them to provide us feedback on when the project might be considered by KTA, what their timeline is, what they would need from us in order to consider it, and what kind of impact having that prepared to a certain level and how far um, would it need to be in order. And then we can then get information, uh, a SECA esti cost estimate from a consultant to complete that and then bring that information back to you. I don't know if you know this, but um, Doug, Mike, where's the um, specs that we had before when we talked about this? Because there were some, what, about three plans? Three plans. And they were, and I'll have to look through my paper, but there were some good ideals. I mean, uh, like the one with the fire department right on the side there. I mean, I, I thought there were some pretty good ideals that didn't seem so costly. Um, so, I mean. Costly. Um, well, I didn't think they were, you know, I, I looked at it to be much more, but I mean, do we still have those? Will the city manager take those with him? I mean, uh, Madam Mayor and Councilwoman, uh, yeah, as you recall, probably a year and a half or two years ago, we started looking at potential options for this area and ultimately had an agreement with the Kansas Turnpike Authority to do <coughs> four sort of back of the nap concept 10% design we split that cost with KTA and as I recall the total cost was 40 or 45,000 mm -hmm. and the city's piece mm -hmm. was half mm -hmm. of that and so we do have those um, there the one that was ultimately voted on by this body is a, I think a different location than mm -hmm. is anticipated by Councilman Emerson mm -hmm. those back of the napkin designs then led to the ultimate cost estimates for the project itself of ranging anywhere from 16 to 20 million dollars as I recall but yes we do have those and I, I would anticipate that in this meeting with Mr. Hewitt that we would we would go through those conversations again thank you deputy mayor thank you. Oh, thank you your honor I'm just curious what the role of J. Doe and the county is with this because this absolutely would help the city and it would help that part of the county. Now, have there been any conversations with them at that point? I mean, I, I would expect that if we would have some aspect of actually building it, um, that they would participate in those costs because of the benefit. I don't know if it's, if it's worth having the conversation now. Um, just when we go to the state to say the city and the county are both very interested in this. Uh, and it may be premature for that. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just wondering if the county's not at the table for this, I actually think they should be because this affects our whole region and that entire part of our area, and it's very important. Councilman Emerson. So, so ju just so I understand, uh, we talked about a lot of things here. Uh, just so I understand the, the city manager's position, and and I do, I, I do really appreciate that. I, I think the thing I bring up every time is, I meet with you is how we can reduce costs, and I, people are uh, tired of us uh, spending money unwisely. Um, so I, I do appreciate uh, your offer, but just so I understand it, if, if I pull my amendment, you're you're basically committing when you you, you meet with the KTA and KDOT, um, if you can find, if they're willing to do something with us on that project, we would then address that through the budget process. Yes, that is my commitment. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, with that, we've had a motion a second, but I believe I can withdraw my motion to amend. Okay, yeah, that, I, I will do that. And I, Mr. Trout, you've always kept your word thus far with me, so. Um, yes. We're good. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments? Oh, we had Councilwoman Clear. <clears throat> I would like to amend the Tyler Street 
project be moved up instead of pushed back again to 2019. And I mean, if it, it, since it was broken down into two parts, if we can only do the first part, fine, which is the Lyman Road to Beverly Street, Tyler to Lyman. But I, I drive that all the time going to Walmart and I see people walking. I mean, you can go there and see the paths made where the sidewalk should be. And um, I, I do think it's dangerous. I agree with Miss Miller. So that's my proposal. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second for, for the sake of conversation by the Deputy Mayor. Comments or questions? Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Ms. Clear, where would you propose, what project would you cut in order to open up the funding for that? I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, that's not my problem. I just think this needs to, this has been pushed back for, what, five years? Um, <coughs> I just want to see it pushed up. Deputy Mayor? With respect, it is our problem. I mean, we're the ones that have to okay this. And I mean, there's, I'm seeing $1.6 million and $1.4 million. No, it's 889 For Tyler? 50. Uh -huh. Well, it's 2050 total. I mean, this is a significant project. Not that it's not important, but I mean, we would have to, we would need to come up with a significant amount of money to do that now. Well, they could, staff could figure out some ways of what they can cut to come up with that. Well, I'm not comfortable approving this unless I know how they're going to do that, because some projects are going to have to get cut. There, no, just, there's they, not can be, they can get moved back, just like this one's been moved back. They can just move um, back that, something That's else. true, but which projects would you, would you recommend moving back? I don't know. I don't have the in-depth knowledge for that Okay. to answer that question. I mean, if staff can come up with some ideas. And that 125000 for the ADA, I'll do that for 50000 I don't know why it's 125000 So, city manager, are there any ideas? Well, the first thing that comes to mind relative to the Tyler project is it's my understanding that's not been designed. So to actually do construction in 2019 would be difficult. So moving it into that timeline um, would would not be as effective. Um, it would carry over into 2020. Um, I'm not sure if any additional right away or any other types of things might be required for that. Um, and at this point, uh, it would take a review to look at with staff to be able to determine whether options there would be as to what project to move back. Um, so that would that would take some time to review. I can't give you an easy answer on that one. Sorry. As far as the ADA, um, is that uh, um, relative to that, I, the number that we have currently in the budget is 125, and I cannot uh, specifically address um, how the estimate was determined. Uh, I would have to, to ask staff to be able to explain how the uh, number was determined. Okay. Councilwoman Hiller. Um, I'll. I'm not sure that this question can be answered at the meeting, but having listened to um, Mrs. Miller the last couple of years and even her letter this morning and today, it seems like what's most important to her is not so much the improvement of the street, the widening of the street, the addition of the, the expensive intersection, but instead getting the street repaved and getting sidewalks. And so, I don't know why it got moved, but I wondered in thinking about it whether for not only saving money, which I've been spending a lot of time thinking about, but also the street project itself, if it were less expensive, if, if it were not as involved, would it be possible to do it sooner just in terms of moving? If, if it's reduced, there's not as much pressure. It looks like most of the project is being funded through the half cent sales tax, the future half cent sales tax, but it must then be in there for just a rehab that as the other ones had been. 
And so if the extra expense is that one of the problems is that there's bonding to do these improvements, maybe they wouldn't be as critical and the sidewalks could go in perhaps sooner as a sidewalk project. We have Dr. Peek um, that would like to make some remarks. City Manager? Yes, I'd like to have Dr. Peek cover uh, part of the reason or the reasoning for the project being moved back and additionally the, the, a better description of the project for everyone to understand what's proposed for that particular project. And it, it is City two Manager. parts. I think that's another part that we need to remember is that it covers a project in 2023 and then the next year as well. So, Dr. Sure. Thank you, governing body. So just to kind of clarify, what, what it's been moved back on the Potter Street project is the construction. When the project actually came into uh, the CIP, design was, was scheduled for uh, 2020. And last year, uh, what we did was we actually expanded the project. The original limits only went to uh, Lyman to Beverly. We expanded that to go down to Paramore. And of course, the funding for that was outside the five-year um, CIP for that second phase. And so what, what it say is, is the original project start has not changed from its original placement in the CIP. But as you've kind of just hit on the discussion point as we structure the funding for these projects and to meet within the uh, policy for geo bond funding, that's what basically has driven that, that project uh, construction to be pushed back. And what I'd say is why is the, to the answer, why are these elements kind of included in the project beyond say a, a rehab and a sidewalk? is uh, Northwest Tyler is a minor arterial. It basically can take you from Gordon or Morse all the way up to US 24. It, it has, it carries a, a high volume of traffic compared to other local streets. And its current configuration is a, a two lane roadway with open ditches, no sidewalks or facilities. And so our intent with this project was to uh, build that to uh, meet the traffic volume and the uses around it. Um, and the process to do that, of course, we're talking a reconstruction project. We're talking impacts to utilities, needing to relocate, move utilities, uh, to basically put in curb and gutter or drainage, or you know, even if you didn't do uh, curb and gutter or drainage, did an open section to make that road uh, accommodate the traffic that it carries. And that takes time. So there's a design process, then there's utility coordination, right-of-way acquisition, and then construction. So that type of project, our process, that's a three-year process to get construction started. Design one year, utility right-of-way the second year, and then starting construction in the third year. And so, you know, uh, we've put it in the, uh, held consistent with design to get those, those questions answered, uh, but just moved out the construction to kind of balance within the other demands uh, within the CIP. Councilman Lesser. In that project then, um, is the, as part of the project, is, is part, have we got the right away from the railroad there at Gordon? Is, is that going to be torn out? Is, the project doesn't come all the way south to Gordon. The southern terminus is Paramore Street. Okay. So it's it's not. I, I just was trying to. I'm, I was a little confused. We'd said you'd said it gone from Gordon as a main thoroughfare all the way to, because it in fact is actually really just one lane right there at Gordon because of the railroad tracks. It comes at an angle, and, and I don't, that's not going to change then, correct? This project will not will not will change, not change that. Answer. The, the other question I have in regards to this size of a project for that location, do we, do we see, um, I, I, I understand the sidewalk portion of it and, and those, those, those types of it, but I don't see um, anything up there from an economic endpoint that impact that's going to drastically improve or change what the traffic patterns are right now. The traffic patterns, I used to drive that every day to my dad's office from when I was 10 year, or 16 years old till, till even today. And so my question is, um, while I see sidewalks for the homeowners in there, there's not, I, I don't see any change in that 
in that area from a traffic impact and then Pika Boulevard is one block over, which is the main thoroughfare. Does that make any sense? I, yes, sir. I mean, I understand where you come from. I just, I think our practice has been as we've taken on these reconstruction projects, we have added curb and gutter and storm drainage and those types of things. And when you start doing those, you're impacting utilities. And I mean, it becomes a full reconstruction project, even if it goes back to the same lane width that's out there today with the added curb and gutter and storm drainage. Uh, it's, it's a uh, complicated process to make sure all the pieces fit together. Uh, but I mean, we can adapt to however the governing body wants to give us feedback on that design process. Uh, that's just been our typical application. And, and there again, my, my position isn't necessarily to, to, to say that this project should never be done, should not, but it, from the other changes that are happening in our city as far as major thoroughfares, you know, to me it appears there's other areas that, that um, our traffic flows are going to be increasing drastically. Um, that if we're going to, I'm difficult at picking and choosing this project to move ahead of some of these other projects that that um, I definitely do see traffic patterns changing. Um, and this one, I really don't. Thank you. Yes, sir. Councilwoman McClear. I, I understand what you're saying, but these people pay taxes too. And this is a quality of life that we always talk about. We talk about walkability. We talk about biking. That's what this, this impacts these people. It may not impact traffic, but it's going to have a big impact on these people. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. So just to be clear, we're already starting design next year anyway, or is that in 2020? 2020. Okay. It's, if you go to uh, page 43, and it actually has the project description. I think maybe part of the misunderstanding is the uh, project summary table at the, on page 7. That's by funding source, so it doesn't... When we have a project that has mixed funding, I, it makes it look like it's starting later than it is. But if you go to page 43, uh, which is the actual project description page, that shows that design would start in 2020. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Clear. And that's great, except we can't count on this because it's been moved so many times. I mean, if I could go, that, this is solid, this is going to happen. Not a problem, but we every year something happens, and that's my concern. Yes, ma'am. Understand. Councilwoman Ortiz, I I struggle with this, um, and but as I think down that street, I'm I'm thinking there's a lot of vacant lots through there. And I'm trying to think, I had to go to the dental place down there, and I, I mean, it's, I'm trying to think of the businesses through there. Um, but the why's further, further down. Um, so I kind of, I kind of struggle with this. Um, I do travel it when I don't feel like going down Topeka Boulevard, but um, if we're going to do it, I want to do it right, um, street-wise. Um, I know there's other grants out there for sidewalks that we could be tapping into, but I just don't, I don't know. Anything in, in the CIP is not promised, it's just in there. Um, and projects do get moved back. I, I did that with the spray park, it got moved back 11 years. That's just how, how it happens. Um. Deputy Mayor? Just a couple of quick questions. Um, are we farming out this design? Yes, we would use a consultant to do the design work. Why isn't this something we can design in-house? Uh, because our role mainly is project managers in-house. I mean, the time and effort to do design work and utility coordination and those things, that's our practice, especially on a project like this that's a going to involve reconstruction, right away, easement acquisition, those types of things. Uh, it, would just, it would be done quicker uh, with outside design. So it's, it's essentially cheaper to farm it out because we don't have experts on staff that do all of these different pieces of the puzzle? 
we have engineers on staff, mm -hmm. but our role as an operation is as project managers, getting the, the projects done as opposed to being the designer of record. And I mean, I just, it's a, I could be happy to chat with you uh, about a design process and what's involved and maybe help you understand, but it just, it's a longer discussion than. Well, I no, I, I mean, I, I trust your judgment. If, if you tell me it's better to have outside folks do the design work, then that's good enough for me. Um, so this is $200,000 to do design, essentially. We're farming it out. Is there $200,000 in the 2019 budget that we could at least do the design work a year early and then from there figure out if we could advance the project beyond that? Because my understanding is part of, part of the issue is we don't know what we need until it gets designed. Is that a fair statement? So, Councilman, what I'd say to you is, I mean, that was part of, this is the exercise we've gone through in putting the CIP together mm -hmm. is allocating the budget dollars sure. in the time frame uh, that we recommended. So. If you would like us to change that, I think we need guidance on what projects you want us to move. Just this specific one. Understand, but that 200, what what other project do you want me to take $200,000 out of to put into this project? And I agree, absolutely. We would have to shovel money around. I'm just, I'm asking if, if we could find $200,000, is our vendor pool capable of taking on this project next year? We can put out an RFP for a consultant to be on board, but I just would, would say to you, it's what project do you want to take it out of? Because that's what we're, we're trying to do is put the CIP together with kind of the technical recommendation. And then we're looking back to you guys to say these projects make sense or they don't make sense or the timing, et cetera, and give us direction on how you want us to move them around. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Okay. Additional comments for staff before Dr. Peek sits down? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. At this point in time, we have in front of us a motion um, to move up the, the, the project for Tyler Street, both parts, um, with a minimum of the first part based on the comments that Councilwoman Clear stated. Um, it was seconded by Deputy Mayor for the purposes of discussion. Um, and at this point in time, I think that we proceed with the voting. Uh, yes, Deputy Mayor. Thank you. So, in your motion, are you asking us to advance the entire schedule as documented by a year? One year. Okay. All right, thank you. A, qu a question. You have a question. Councilman Cohen. Just so I'm clear, what, what street is this that we're talking Tyler. about? Tyler. On North Topeka. Just north of, oh, North Topeka. Okay. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Hiller. Just to clarify at this point, and because there is a limited amount of money available total, mm -hmm. and we have made a policy commitment not to exceed um, bonding amounts and so on, and we haven't taken anything out of these particular years for GEO bond, um, I, I just think before people vote, I mean, is there going to be a, a corresponding obligation on the part of this body to figure out what would be cut or moved? How do we do that? I think that that's what staff just told us, that if, if we're going to make the recommendation that Dr. Peak just made was if there is going to be such a vote of moving forward with this project, then we have to make the similar subsequent motion after this to eliminate something, something for the same amount of money that we are moving forward. Councilwoman Clear. Then I would need to understand every single reason why every single thing was put in this book. That makes no sense to me. That I have to go through and understand why this was there, what this was there, when they could just make a suggestion, yeah, we could move that back because it's not as they have that knowledge. Or we all have, would have to understand that. City Manager. Uh, Councilwoman Clear, that's part of the reason as staff that we pull the various parts together in order to present. Um, I understand these decisions and are not always popular relative to the situation, um, but that's what we're charged with. Um, as we look at this in the future, and that's why I made the comments that I did regarding how we will handle this in the future with a workshop, 
is that we'll be able to talk through the, some of those issues relative to what staff is proposing. I know that may not help, that does not help now regarding your concerns for the Tyler project, but that's the best that I can provide you at this point. Councilwoman Clear. Then I'm going to ask as, um, that we pull this and talk about it at the budget time as we're doing with the interchange. Councilwoman Hiller. I'm not sure I follow you exactly, but if you're, I'm not sure that it would be in the interest of what you want to pull this, to, mm -hmm. to pull this out no. of the CIP, no. but if you wanted to withdraw your motion with a commitment to talk about it further about ways we could move it up. I just didn't want you to. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? Kind of, because okay. I kind of understand what's happening with the interchange and not. Um, so whatever we're doing with the interchange, but you actually pulled it out of here. No. No, no ma'am. No. I just went through my. Would do the motion. A mo my so it's amendment. still in there, like a beacon. So mm -hmm. can I do that? Yeah. That's what I want to do. Okay, so I we have a motion to withdraw. Yes. Can I make one additional comment? Yes, absolutely, you, City Manager. Um, yes, that's what we'll do. You know, even if we were had a desire to move this up without having anyone on staff for consultant, mm -hmm. you know, no one ready to even tell design, mm -hmm. those types of things, we are talking about a smaller item for discussion, and I can provide that information to you at that point. Perfect. It's a similar type of discussion relative to that. Well, it would end up being part of the discussion as far as where we would put it and changes that we would make relative to it. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Additional amendments for the CIP. Councilwoman Ortiz. Thank you. Um, I know I keep being told on the parking lot between um, the chambers and our city hall and um, the courthouse. And I know we keep talking about the design. How can we get that in the CIP um, as soon as possible? Or what are our plans on that? It's first in line and not funded. <laughs> <laughs> City you know, I, I am so sick of being disrespected by Mr. Henderson and Ms. Hiller. <laughs> um, what I can tell you is, is that I've had discussions with Director Peak, and we are looking at a a, some work done by our staff that will allow us to improve that parking lot. We have the capability to do lay down of asphalt, and so that's something that he's committed to me that we will take a look at as a project. It will not be a comprehensive, the whole lot type project, but it will be something that will um, improve er various areas. Probably similar, um, check with Dr. Peake, but similar to what was done regarding the curb or you're taking the lay down machine, covering large spots, looking at those areas that need that type of treatment, and that will grant us some additional time to have this as it moves forward in the project as a process. Well, I can appreciate that. I think Dr. Peek is tired of me saying, what's the, what's the code word, and it's, you know, potholes, and I think he's sick of that. But we gotta do something because it's tearing up cars, and mine is one of them. And, it, and, and you know, we have a lot of, people that go in and out of there. And, you know, I blamed it on the city or the, the county because the city told me it was the county, so I blamed the county and now it, it is our, our responsibility. So we just we just really need need to do something about that. So that's why I'm asking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Deputy Mayor. Thank you. I don't have any amendments. I just want to commend everybody, uh, the staff, the council, and the general public who takes this very, very seriously. This is building the future of Topeka. I mean, this is one of the most important things we do because it's, it's planning our future. It's planning how our city is going to function, what infrastructure, where it's going to be, how we improve things. And I would just like to commend everybody who spent incredible amounts of time looking through this, trying to figure out if there's a way to make it better. Are we working at peak efficiency? And then I thank the public for double checking us. Um, it never hurts to take a second look, and I think we've done that this year, and I commend everyone for working on that. Thank you. Absolutely, I would agree. I mean, for those of you that are at home, you have no idea the immense amount of hours the staff has put into ensuring that all of our questions are being tended to. 
I just received a document of 30 something pages, um, not exaggerating, 30 something pages full of explanations of every single thing that the council had been concerned about, um, the devotion of staff to ensuring that we have adequate information is, is something to absolutely be commended. Additional amendments? Councilman Lesser. I have a few here. Um, first one I, I want to kind of walk through briefly is, is uh, page 117, the ADA review, and I have a couple questions on that. <laughs> um, educate me from the standpoint when, when a uh, individual brings plans for the construction of a new building and the plans go to, to the planning department. Are, are those reviewed for ADA compliance? Uh, Councilman, I would say that um, as far as if as we design a project and we ask our consultants, such as the City Hall project, there will be, um, that will be a component of the requirement for someone that would design our building is that we would do that. Um, I'd have to ask Mr. Finder with regards to, yeah. The answer is yes, but how detailed, Mr. Finder could go into more detail if you desire. And so then, then my next question then on that is then when, when, the, when the project is complete, you know, when, when, when the inspections go to, to, to the inspection process after the project is complete, are they then inspected again by our city inspectors to make sure they are in compliance with the ADA? Yes. Based on that information, I, I would recommend that if, if we're competent enough to do it at the planning process, we're competent enough to do it at the inspection process, I, I would you know, request that we pull out the 125,000 um, for the review and use staff to do that off a checklist, off the same parameters they use when they design, when they uh, review the design of a building or the same process they use when they do the inspection of a building after it's complete. Um, if we're competent enough to do it at those two points, those junctures, I don't see any sense in hiring an outside firm and spending that type of money to do that. Is that a motion? Yes. yes. Second. If we have a second. <coughs> Questions? This motion, yes, Deputy Mayor. Is there a liability aspect of doing that? Um, I mean, we don't do our own audit for obvious reasons. I'm wondering, is, is this being done so that, you know, basically there's, there's a, a barrier of liability there? Well, I think the issue of having a specific consultant do it was that their expertise may be greater than ours. Um, but uh, as I look at this project, uh, there would be more work that I'll do to make sure that we are at the highest level as far as our company, our, uh, uh, our comparable ability to be able to attack this type of a project. And my follow-up question to that is, is oh, given that, is this something we need to worry about this year since it's not in there until 2021? I mean, we're not even allocating funding for it. So. Yes. I mean, we're, we're looking at it uh, in 2021, but obviously with this direction, we'll take a look at what we need to do regarding you know, a review as soon as possible. Deputy City Manager. Uh, Mayor and Councilman Jensen, just uh, Deputy Mayor, in direct answer to that question, it's in 2021, which is part of the capital improvement budget. Mm -hmm. So you are in effect allocating funds for it this year. So it would be, you would need to address it if you would like to. That's true, but we don't actually come up with the money for that until the year before. Deputy Mayor, by authorizing the projects in the CIB, you're giving staff approval to move forward with them. It's anticipated it will be in that year, but we would have the authority to move forward. Okay. I'm not sure that's how we've done in the past, but I could be wrong on that. I feel like if when we actually do the budget each year, we approve that again. And we'll do a CIP next year, which we'll reapprove again, and this will be in that because it's a span. So we would be reapproving it again next year, and then again the year after, which at either point it could be pulled. Is that not correct, Councilman I, or Deputy Mayor? Excuse me. Uh, this is the process we've used since mm -hmm. uh, I arrived in 2014. Right. You are correct that next year the CIP CIB would be 
reexamined, mm -hmm. and certainly it could be taken out. But again, we would have the authority to move forward with right. it, but not until based on your vote tonight. So we still have two more years to look at this and pull it if we don't feel it should be funded. That, that's where I was going with that. Okay, Councilwoman Heller. Thank you, Mayor. I, I will support that amendment. I really was troubled by that one all along. Um, there was discussion earlier about plans that get made and then really aren't used. And by the time you get to a project, you do it over again. And given the different ages and different accessibility quotients in each of our buildings already, I was and the, and the availability of people even from independent living programs to come and do an audits for you if you need one. And, and but the checklist thing, it was just hard to imagine that that would be a value to spend right now. Also, I personally, but I, I, and I appreciate the city manager and the staff as well, I think we're trying to move ourselves to a point where we really are honoring, especially the CIB, as something that if we voted on it in year X, it stays the same so that the staff can count on it, that we put enough thought into it, that we knew that we felt strongly that a project that was in there was well-founded and would be a good investment. Um, so I, I, I think that's important. But with that, I, I will support the amendment. Okay. <laughs> Additional comments? Seeing none, this motion is to remove $125,000 slated for an assessment of our ADA capabilities. So this will, in effect, remove $125,000 from, from our debt load. No, it's cash. And, I mean, cash, sorry. Thank you. Yes, 125. I guess my question then is, how are they gonna do it? How are they, you're recommending to staff do it then? Yes. To, yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Seeing no further questions, we proceed, oh, Councilwoman Ortiz. So it's my understanding that the city manager is going to look to see if staff can do it, correct? Sure. Right. We'll be performing it, and I will find whether we have the appropriate staff. Given that this was already scheduled for 2021, we're going to ensure that all ADA requirements are met. I believe they are currently, but we will find a tool. We'll find a way to, to work through that. If I find that we have a shortfall, we don't have a particular individual necessary, I'll circle back relative to looking at hiring one. But if we pull it, then it's not going to be there if we need it, right? Right, but it was already not scheduled until 2021. So it would have been two years if it left as it is. A bigger issue would have been as if it was scheduled for next year. I was already not looking as is proposed by staff that we would be doing it next year. So this really isn't changing that much other than we're going to internally reevaluate how we're going to conduct an, an ADA review. But wouldn't it be better to leave it and then you come back to us next year and with an answer? Well, if, if I find that there's a specific need, I'll bring it back next year. But we're going to ensure that we're in require we're meeting the requirements. Okay. We proceed with the voting. We have eight yes with Ms. Ortiz and Mr. Jensen voting no. Okay, eight voting yes, the motion passes. Councilman next, Lesser. Next item I have is I want to address, um, um, and, and I, I certainly don't want to try to convey that, that, that this wasn't done properly in, in the past, but I want to address the issue of the snow removal in regards to the half cent citywide uh, curb and gutter project. Um, through my conversations with many individuals in, in the community, um, in, in voting on the, the half cent um, sales tax for the curb and gutter, um, everyone, everyone unanimously that I spoke with was not aware that snow removal um, was used, funds from this account were used for snow removal. Um, from 2014 through last year, um, of that uh, citywide half cent tax, 1.4 million was spent on curb and gutter projects, and 2 million 52,000 was spent on actual snow removal. My point 
of this is more as such of um, my motion would would be that that uh, I guess I don't know if it would necessarily be the motion, but my my my, my position is that I want it when the half cent sales tax comes up um, for renewal. If if in fact how that goes, um, I would want snow snow removal to be clarified in in the ballot question so our voters understand that snow removal is what part of what is being paid for out of this tax um, um, if not then then i would want um, it then to be a, if not then i would rather than have it be amended where snow removal costs cannot be paid for out of the half cent curb and gutter tax um, i don't have a problem if our constituents want us to do that and understand that's what the process is um, but as I said, unanimously, I've spoken with no one who was under the impression that when they voted for that sales tax, that money was going to be used for snow removal. Most everyone who I speak with believed that that was uh, in the operating budget, part of the, the business of doing city business, um, uh, was cleaning the streets, clearing the streets. So this was not so much a motion, but it's a statement of one of the things that you would like to see in the future? Well, I think it's similar to Mr. Emerson's as far as withdrawing his motion, but mm -hmm. um, I guess I'm asking a question as well as of city managers is how he um, feels we could proceed to make sure that we can accomplish both of those. And if, in fact, nothing needs to be tonight, done tonight, then that's fine. Mayor, Councilman Lesser, I do not believe it should be addressed tonight. I think it is something that as we go into the discussion and the final approval of a half cent sales tax resolution requesting it to be placed on the ballot, that at that point it would need to be addressed per you and that that would be the appropriate time to ensure that the ballot measure as it stands would be uh, in the form that you would like. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there any additional amendments to be provided from the body? I have some discussion. Councilwoman uh, Hiller. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I think I've made my position early on in terms of concern about the budget. Um, my understanding was that this evening we were going to talk about amendments, but it, it was not going to be voted on until the 15th. That will be up to this body. I do want to share um, some of the thoughts that, that I've had, and those are my own, as well as meeting with individuals, meeting with staff. I really want to thank the staff. Um, I had the time this year to do that deep dive, um, was driven by the review of the fourth quarter financials, which had now been updated in that 36-page piece to the first, um, first quarter of 2018. Um, so I appreciate the comments from everyone. I want to throw another layer, I guess, on consideration either for tonight or if people choose not to for the future. Um, in that first quarter financial document, similar to what was in the fourth quarter that we all already had, um, there are over $62 million worth of GO projects that are in process right now. That, um, they, they were opened prior to 2018 for GO bonds, and while the city has an agreed limit of $9 million a year, got confirmation after five today that of that 62 million most of us thought that we didn't bond until projects were done at least i did and a lot of others did apparently all but 14 million of that are bonded already that still makes me nervous in terms of the fact that they've been open for anywhere from one to seven or years or so i know that staff is working on the management of those projects but i think it's something we need to be aware of that would still leave 14 million that isn't bonded yet in the hopper as we add another 9 million a year. Um, staff, in the course of questions that I asked, and I, I can get copies to people, I didn't bring them tonight, but I asked for what the interest rate was and therefore the cost markup, what staff was projecting for GO bond projects as well as revenue bond projects. With interest rates starting to tick up, the staff's estimate was that all of our GO bond projects will, will add at least 34. If they're bonded, it'll add 34% to the cost. 
if they're if they're bonded for 15 years, which we've knocked knocked that bonding limit back, which is good. The city has increased its um, so with that, if we even hold the line on the nine million, our costs will go up, and we have to pay those costs out of the general fund budget, the operating budget. So, I. I think we all need to have an eye on that as we, as we proceed. The city has increased the dollars, and it's in the book here, bonded annually with revenue bonds over 50% in the course of the past 10 years. It's notched up from a, a lower amount to 50% higher by 2017. The proposed CIP that we have here proposes to triple the annual amount that we bond with revenue bonds in the next five years. That is huge. They didn't end up with a chart in the book, but we got, in, in answers to some questions, got a chart emailed to everybody along the way. The revenue bonds uh, with interest and finance charges have a higher rate in the first place, and then they're generally 30-year bonds. The staff's estimate is that the markup on those will be 83%. So you almost, it's 50-50 in terms of cash and you know, what you're paying for projects and what it's costing you to finance them. That, it, we just all need to know it, no matter what we think about it. Um, that just limits how far new dollars, new ratepayer dollars can go if we bond everything that we do. The utilities pro forma in our book, pro forma meaning the budget um, in the notebook, um, looked at what it thought the revenue fee from fees, we've been increasing rates, what the revenue from fees would be, and what the cost for debt service would be. The estimates are that the rates for fees would go up about, they only do four, four years of budget in here, that the, that the fee revenue would go up $10.5 million a year over that time. But correspondingly, the estimate in that budget is that our debt service will go up $9 million of that 10 and a half. Um, that doesn't leave a lot left over for operating or for doing more with cash and getting 100% of the money on the street or under the street in the case of utilities. Um, that, this same book that we have says that with that schedule, we are still um, are likely to have $225 million worth of unfunded projects at the end of the 10-year plan. Flashback to present day, what we've been dealing with in the last two years with operating budget. To get our streets to the 60 PCI that we've all talked about, those of us that have been on anyway know that, recall that we're using, that we're with how much money we had in the budget, we were, including the half cent sales tax money, we were still $5 million a year short of what it would take for us to even get to, to 60 PCI. Now we figured that out last year. You know, we decided to spend three years, spread the leftover countywide tax over three years, three some million a year. Staff found us two million last year to make that total of five. So we did it. And we've asked them to look for the two million for this year. We won't have either of those. We'll need an extra $5 million a year for the next three years of this plan just to hit the 60 PCI. We have to find that money somewhere to do that. Recall, we got the sales tax reports. Our general fund revenue has increased only slightly, and sales tax as well. Not enough to cover the increases that we want to do for salaries and operating costs out of our operating budget. Um, we've had extensive discussions as we've talked about this plan about wants versus needs, cost effectiveness, and return on investment. In my review of these projects as well as conversations that I've had, and you've heard some examples here, not all these projects have met that test. I think we need to be bold in terms of looking at cutting out of that capital budget because it pushes straight into that operating budget, which I know staff's already working on.
both for the both for the capital borrowing budget in the future as well as for our operating budget. I brought with me today um, what I just shared is on the front of this document. Otherwise, there's a list of suggestions. I'm not going to go through all of them tonight, but I think it, it does total up to more than 20 million in savings. Maybe when you looked at that list, you would, a couple of them got voted on already tonight, so about whatever, five million of that got voted on already. Um, maybe you wouldn't want to do some of those items, but you would flip through the book or would have in mind something else. I think we can do it, and I think we need to take that edge off our borrowing and our capital commitments so that we can make budget and so that we can pay our bills. Looping back to that budget, that budget only went out four years. With those interest rates going up on GO bonds as well as um, revenue bonds, I asked for, for charts and for an amortization schedule that went out 30 years so we could all see what that looked like. I, haven't, I asked for it back in March when I first saw the budget. And I think staff felt like the budgets that were in here were good enough. But I think it'd be eye-popping for all of us. Um, if you want it, I'm sure we can ask for it. Um, again, because people haven't seen this list, I wasn't going to try and run all these as amendments this evening. But I hope people would consider. Thank you. City Manager. Um, Mayor, if I could, I'd like to ask uh, Finance Director Lee uh, to come forward or Nick re related to explaining where we are at with our bonding and as the process that we're using um, relative to attempting to, re to do projects and how we're managing that um, to shed a little light on uh, the process that they've been using. So, Dr. Lee. Thank you. Um, just kind of a maybe a general reaction to the outstanding project, project list, the fourth quarter report that was referenced, is that um, that does that is a list of current projects that the city is currently working on. Um, so the great majority of those projects, you know, the 62, min, 62 million that was mentioned that's referenced on the list in front of you, um, and then the utilities in addition to that, already have funds in those project accounts to be used for those projects. So. That is not a list of, you know, projects that still need to be funded. That's in addition to the current CIP. Um, that's a list of projects that we're simply still working on in one way, shape, or form. Um, many of those projects are on there for several years for multiple reasons. A lot of these are very complicated long-term projects. Um, or there are some changes in needs and philosophies. Happy to answer any questions about that. Um, so the process generally what we do once the CIP is adopted is we then, as you know, kind of roll it right into the, the budget process um, where all of those uh, figures are ab able to tie out before that's presented to you, which is why it's so important that the CIP is adopted uh, before the budget, so ideally by May. That way everything in the budget can reflect everything that had been approved by the governing body. In addition to that, the reason that that timing is so timely is that we come back throughout the months of May and June and build our next um, funding list for projects that we need to be including in the next bond issuance. So as part of that process, we go through the outstanding project list, we look at the approved CIP, and then we roll that all into what we believe is funds that will be needed in the next issuance, and that's presented to you all um, typically in August of that coming year. So really all, it really does all, all tie in together. Um, there's no stone unturned. I can guarantee we have all those debt schedules. We have all of the projections um, worked in. Um, and certainly the night of, you know, between CIP budget and the, the night that we actually go out for bonds, happy to help kind of connect those dots anywhere and everywhere that's needed. Is that what you're wanting or anything in addition? Thank you, okay. Thank you very much. Does anybody? Yes, Mayor Councilman Emerson. Um, Thank you, Mrs. Lee. Uh, thanks for coming up, and, and thanks for uh, all the help you've been over the last uh, several weeks through all the phone calls and emails, and uh, uh, I, I really appreciate everything you guys are doing. I did have a question, though. During our conversation this morning, um, I found out something that I didn't know. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but what I believe you told me was on some of these projects that are geo-bonded, we go ahead and bond it even before the project is done or at some point in it? 
uh, is, is and then we have the money setting in an account to pay. Is that is that correct? Because I always thought we temp noted everything, and then only once the project was done, we we bonded it because we knew the amount for the bond. Then, um, so the short answer to that is that that's our decision on how we want to finance a project. So there are a lot of federal regulations that gives us kind of some restrictions on what we can and can't do. But that's our decision when we want to go out and get the final bonds on projects. Um, on the large, you know, the large street projects, construction projects where there are a lot of unknowns, we have traditionally done temporary financing leading up to the time for the final notes because once you go out for permanent bonds, you can't rebond that project. So on the large, complicated projects, um, we might be over committing funds, which wouldn't be the right thing to do for taxpayers. Or perhaps you do that three years down the road, you find out that there were additional funds needed. You all would need to amend the project budget, and there might be a need for some additional funds on that project. So I think that everyone would understand, especially on those large projects, that there would be a um, requirement or a request that we would get that temporary financing before. Um, however, that doesn't have to be that way. Um, cities can do that with different approaches. We could choose to go ahead and, and get bonds, let's say, in August, um, but we're running the risk of either over-financing, mm -hmm. and then at the end of the project, um, anything that's extra would go back to the taxpayers, but it could be five years later. I mean, we'd get those bonds, they'd sit in that project account for five years before it would be allocated back, um, or it could go the opposite direction where you're, you're under-financing and then you're running the risk of either needing to find cash, doing another project. That, of course, would not be a good situation either. Um, so really, it kind of depends on on the specific project and the philosophy of the city. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. And Nick, if I could thank you for that. Um, so just two, two follow-up questions then. The first is, is any of this money setting in, in these accounts, is that included in what we're considering to be our surplus right now, our reserve fund? Um, we actually have, so in addition to the you know general fund, debt service fund, we have a capital projects fund. So anything that's in the 800 level or the 825 level, which that's kind of the accounting side of it, all of these are sitting in those. Those are not budgeted funds. They're included in the audit, audit and they're included in the CAFR, but they are not considered something that is budgeted in the same annual appropriation process as everything else. And the reason for that is because of the nature of these types of projects is that, you know, at any given moment, we're investing those funds because it's just, you know, it could be millions of dollars that your, your, your cash flow of those types of projects is, is just large amounts of money. Um, so that one we do not actually consider part of our, our budgeted reserve. It is part of our liquidity as a city, so we are able to invest that. Um, and from an auditing standpoint, it is um, funds that we have and we own but it would not be considered any part of any of our budgeted reserves. Is that something, could we possibly get a printout of what those are? I mean, I don't know how many funds you're talking about. Is that something you could do without needing? Um, yeah, and off the top of my head, it is included in the quarterly. We have the uh, treasurer's report on the back of our financial report. Okay. So that would include that, but I'll go make sure that that's in a format that would be answering your question and we can send that as a follow-up. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. If we could possibly get what the temp note balance is because I have the same concern as uh, Councilwoman Hiller that, oh my gosh, we've authorized $150 million in projects. We've only you know, spent 60 or whatever the number was. And there, I was really afraid there was going to be a huge, some huge surprise that there's $50 million we had to bond all of a sudden. So, so thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. So we have a document for consideration. We have had everybody propose their amendments. At this point, I would ask if there's no additional amendments, then what we would have in front of us is the CIP budget with the amendments that have been currently approved. Um, we do have a motion and we have a second on the table. So if there's no further discussion or comments, I would ask if you are ready for a vote for the CIP. Councilwoman Hiller. Only a comment. Um, if people don't want to consider it further, I really appreciate the work everyone's done. I will vote no at this time and do everything that I can to contribute to the further conversations. Thank you very much. Okay, we proceed with the voting. This would approve the CIP with the amendments that we've made.
Time's a charm. Okay. Now you can start. <laughs> okay, we have seven yes, Hiller, Clear, and Emerson <clears throat> voting no. Seven having voting yes, the CIP passes. At this point in time, it is 8.10. We typically have a five-minute recess. Um, we will take such recess before we re-engage. We will be back in the chambers by 8.15. Councilwoman Ortiz, yes. <coughs> yes, which should be a pass-through pretty much. Yeah, five minutes. Five minutes. 